And we will continue the discussion of genetics and genomics of this class of tumors with uh, Ramin Barakim. I put, I pronounce your name that way. He pronounced it differently. You can tell us exactly how it's pronounced. Yeah, you, you know, actually, <laughs> I actually don't know exactly how it's pronounced. Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's supposed to be pronounced Ruchim, but I try not to do that because I end up spitting at people uh, too much. So, um, right. So, so uh, I'd like to talk. Um, so about the uh, you know pediatric uh, glioma genomes, genetic studies of uh, pediatric gliomas. I'm going to start with uh, an overview of just the general uh, mutations that are observed in pediatric gliomas, and then uh, talk about uh, some work we've done to sort of explore the consequences of one of those mutations. Um, uh, I should say at the outset that um, uh, most of the work that I'm going to be describing, that uh, to the extent I was involved, it was in, in, in collaboration with Keith Ligon, who just who just spoke, as well as uh, many other people in this room. Um, so uh, one thing that Keith described was uh, the clinical profiling that he and his wife have set up, whereby every, just about every patient, uh, at, uh, you know, uh, every uh, child at, at Children's Hospital who has a brain tumor ends up getting uh, uh, genome-wide you know, uh, genetic profiling, uh, including copy number profiling. Um, and so we uh, um, compiled uh, copy number profiles of 146 uh, pediatric brain tumors, and this is work that's been led by uh, Mimi Bandabadai uh, here and, and uh, Shaq Ramkasun, um, uh, just to look at what patterns we see. And, and what one can see is that, um, so, this, so each, each uh, column here is a different tumor, and, um, and then the rows are uh, sort of the different chromosome arms. And, there, um, and regions of red are um, amplified, regions in blue are deleted. So there, there are uh, you know, quite a lot of copy number changes in some of the tumors. Um, and those tumors tend to be uh, these red guys, the um, embryonal tumors, the medullo medulloblastoma type tumors. Um, the gliomas, which are in blue, often have no events at all, or sometimes uh, very few events. There are a few gliomas that cluster with these embryonal tumors with lots of events, but uh, the, you know, a lot really have very little disruption. Um, and this you know, speaks to a point that was made earlier, that there's, these are, uh, in general, simpler tumors than their adult counter counterparts. Well, one of the reasons that many of these tumors have little disruption is because um, uh, many of them are low grade. Um, and so if you, uh, the, the, you know, on average, uh, low-grade gliomas will have only about 5% of their genomes altered by copy number changes, or even less. Um, High-grade tumors have more uh, disruption, up to about 20%. Even that is less than the uh, um, amount of, uh, you know, number of copy number events in the, uh, their adult counterparts. I should say for the low-grade uh, gliomas, adult low-grade gliomas have extensive copy number di uh, disruption, and, and, and sort of pointing to Chuck's point that these are very different from the adult counterparts. And then the medulloblastomas have the most. Now, looking beyond just uh, copy number changes at the mutations, um, uh, Keith with Mark Kieran um, and uh, Nadia Chibato and others at, at Toronto um, did uh, uh, genetic profiling of a large number of um, high-grade gliomas. Uh, and uh, 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 so in, in, in most of these underwent um, whole exome profiling. And, eight, and so this is a view of 82 different samples. And um, what we see, as has been described uh, uh, to some extent already, is that the uh, location of the tumor really can determine much about its um, genotype. So these um, histone mutations are near universal among the midline um, uh, high-grade uh, gliomas um, uh, and only occur in a few of the cortical uh, gliomas. And in those that do occur in the cortical gliomas tend to be a certain uh, the G34R uh, or V uh, subtype. Um, likewise, uh, there are a lot of p53 pathway mutations that um, maybe mo a bit more in the midline uh, tumors than in the high grade uh, in the cortical tumors, uh, and, and conversely, um, the IDH1 mutations, uh, CEPT2 mutations, and then the, the few BRAF mutations in the high grades tend to occur more in the cortical tumors. In addition, we see a lot of mutations in growth factor receptors. Um, uh, and there's several of these, and we'll br break that out in a little bit more detail in the next slide, um, uh, as well as uh, P3 kinase pathway mutations, um, and, then, and then various other actors. So, um, uh, the, uh, so if, 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 uh, at the same time that this um, paper was published, um, there's another paper published uh, um, which uh, also had a nice figure which broke out specifically the DIPGs, the, uh, the diffuse intrinsic pontine gliomas that Keith uh, just described, um, 
And uh, these are uh, you know, uh, striking in their, first of all, rate of ACVR1 mutations, which are absent from the other high-grade gliomas, at, at least in this view. I, th I think there are cases in which can, one can find ACVR1 in other uh, sets, but, but it tends to be concentrated in the DIPGs. ACVR1 is a growth factor receptor. One of, the, one of them. There are other growth factor receptors that are mutated across the, more across the board, PDGFRA, MET, um, EGFR, and then there's the NTRAX. Um, the, uh, and then the histone mutations are also very prevalent in the DIPGs. Um, beyond this, you know, uh, there are many mutations in the, the pediatric uh, high-grade gliomas that are present also in uh, adult high-grade gliomas, and some of these were mentioned, ATRX, um, MIC, MICN, uh, PDGFRA, and MET, and EGFR. Uh, but um, uh, overall, the, the rates of these are, are, are much different. You know, if in EGFR mutations, for instance, uh, although they sometimes, or alterations, I should say, often applications, although they sometimes occur in pediatric gliomas, um, they're much rarer than their adult counterparts. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, that, that's a, sort of a general overview of the uh, high-grade gliomas. And so, uh, just, I think this, this, the summary points that I think about is that compared to their adult um, counterparts, they have relatively simple genomes. Nevertheless, the high-grade tumors do um, have, tend to have multiple driver events per tumor. Um, these drivers vary by location. Um, and uh, some of the most prominent uh, drivers are the chromatin regulators, P53 pathway mutations, and uh, growth factor receptors. Um, and given the propensity for these tumors to have growth factor receptor alterations, um, that sort of suggests uh, you know, therapeutic targets, and then as well as the IDH1 mutations um, and so on. Uh, so there, do, there are uh, you know, what appear to be tractable, tractable therapeutic targets in many of these tumors. Some of them don't have uh, any obvious tractable therapeutic targets. And, and uh, none, none of these, uh, no targeted therapeutic has yet been shown to be uh, effective in the clinic, uh, um, as, uh, as far as I'm aware. So, um, so that's high-grade gliomas. In comparison, uh, the low-grade gliomas are e e much simpler. This is a uh, view of copy number changes across the genome show, uh, uh, along the y-axis among uh, about f 40 or so uh, low-grade gliomas um, along the x-axis. Um, and uh, what we've, uh, it, it, this, is, this is one that was generated by actually, again, uh, Keith's lab in, in, in published in collaboration with us uh, a few years ago, where uh, one of the interesting things that we found is that most of these tumors had no copy number events that we could uh, identify. There were a fair number that had a few copy number events, but even these tend, for the most part, just to have like, you know, one, two, or a, 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 just a few, not a extensive disruption. Uh, when we went into um, higher detail and did whole genome sequencing uh, to 90x depth of you know, individual tumors, what we would find are things like this, where there was a single rearrangement in this tumor uh, between the MIB family member MIB-L1 and a, a neighboring gene, which resulted in an amplification of this site here. But there was no other uh, copy number change um, uh, in, in, um, elsewhere in the uh, tumor that we could identify. There were mutations, but none of those mutations affected protein coding uh, sequences. So um, we're, what we're reduced to is a single event in this tumor that affects uh, protein coding genes. When you um, extend that to larger numbers of tumors um, in a study that was led by uh, Mimi um, uh, and uh, uh, Lori Ramkasun and um, others uh, it, uh, from, from my group, Keith's group, and then uh, also Adam Resnick's group down in at, uh, at Chalk, um, uh, we analyzed actually 172 pediatric low-grade glioma uh, genetic profiles. Um, including uh, these 154, um, uh, most of these were um, uh, profiled by whole genome sequencing. And um, uh, the, uh, you know, each tumor, again, is a column. And the different mutation, the different genes that underwent recurrent mutations are shown as rows here. Um, the most frequent uh, driver you know, gene was BRAF. BRAF um, alterations were present in over half the samples. Um, uh, one thing to note is that each sample tended to only undergo one alteration, um, sim similar to the you know, uh, genome that I showed before. Uh, in the cases of the BRAF alterations, again, the, the vast majority were rearrangements, as was described by Keith, um, uh, between BRAF and a neighboring gene KIA uh, 1549. Uh, a few of them were BRAF V600E mutations. 
Um, these are you know, all exciting because uh, we know that you know, BRAF V6D mutations are uh, treatable with vemurafenib when they occur in melanomas. Um, uh, and, and so, you know, there's obvious ways to take the, the thoughts about taking this to the clinic. It's not quite as clear how to treat a BRAF rearrangement. Uh, there's some reason to think that the um, uh, existing uh, inhibitors would uh, actually be counterproductive in that setting, and, and Chuck will, uh, I believe, talk a little bit more about that. And so BRAF is very prominent. Um, then there are, you know, a, a variety of other genes that, that occur less, um, that are altered less often. Uh, FGFR1 uh, is, um, a, you know, a potentially tractable therapeutic target, which is rearranged and mutated. Um, there are, you know, mutations in IDH1 and a few tumors, and then again, NTREC2 and 3 uh, um, uh, rearrangements. Well, one of the interesting things to, um, that, uh, that I see in this is that, you know, the, the majority of these tumors are undergoing rearrangements of some type or other rather than mutations, which sort of uh, uh, separates this from other tumor types. Um, and, uh, and, and, and so, so we'll get back to that. So anyway, so many of these events are therapeutically tractable. There's the, actually, uh, unfortunately, the, the second most commonly altered gene is one that we don't tend to think of as a good therapeutic target, and that's MIB. Uh, MIB family members, so MIB and its uh, uh, family member, MIB L1, are altered in, um, uh, when you total up this, these two rows, uh, about 10% of the tumors that we've evaluated. Uh, so this makes it, it actually the second most, these MIB family members, the second most frequent uh, uh, driver event, uh, you know, uh, affected by the second, uh, sort of most, second, second most frequently altered genes in pediatric low-grade um, uh, gliomas. Um, and among the MIB alterations, uh, there's a specific fusion to, MIB, to QKI, um, which uh, accounts for you know, the largest proportion of them, and which uh, tends to occur within a specific tumor type, subtype, um, angiocentric gliomas, um, where we see you know, uh, six out of the seven angiocentric gliomas we profiled had this specific rearrangement. None of the other tumors we profiled had that, making it sort of pathognomonic uh, 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 practically for, for, for this tumor type. So some summary points in terms of the low-grade gliomas. Uh, first is that there's uh, only one driver per tumor. Um, often those drivers are subtype specific. Maybe that's a good thing, because if you can target that driver therapeutically, maybe that's all you need, like CML, right? CML has uh, BCR-able alterations. Um, if you target them, uh, you may cure the tumor. Uh, um, on the other hand, if you can't target, uh, 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 you know, target that driver event effectively, then you know, uh, are you out of luck? Um, that, that, uh, so th I think there needs to be a, a lot of effort put into those, specifically those events that aren't where it isn't clear how to target them, uh, and, and look also at what else in those uh, tumors can be targeted, uh, other than the, these, these specific driver events. Um, but also, the fact that there are si only single driver events per, you know, just one driver event uh, per tumor in most cases, uh, raises, you know, in interesting questions. Typically, you know, when you transform cells, you, you think about having to do it with five or six events, and here we're looking at one. Um, so how does that happen? Uh, and, and there are multiple possibilities. One is that there, there, it may be that these tumors arise in a particular epigenetic or environmental context that enables tumor growth. Um, uh, uh, Chuck mentioned uh, that Daphne Haskogan has shown uh, P10 methylation in uh, many of these tumors, which may be activating the PI3 kinase pathway. And also he mentioned that when children grow up, um, they, uh, uh, that these tumors often stop progressing. Um, and so there's, a, you know, when they become adults, and so there may be something about environmental uh, in that setting as well. Um, there may be cryptic gen genetic events that we're not identifying. And then also it may be that these individual events that we see in these, these low-grade gliomas, um, these pediatric tumors, are more complex in their outcomes, in their effects, than the, um, than the mutations we see in many other tumor types. And, and, and to me, again, the, the fact that we're seeing all these rearrangements is striking. The rearrangements, by definition, are bringing together two sites of DNA. So it's a, in a single event, you're affecting more than one site of DNA. So we delved into a little, um, a, a little more detail in terms of the, um, one of these events to try to understand it better. I'm just going to describe uh, the complexities that we found, and that's the MIB-QKI alterations that I described. Again, tumors that undergo MIB-QKI alteration undergo, um, have no other events in the genome. These are copy number profiles across the genome on the x-axis of a couple of tumors with MIB-QKI alterations. We see copy number changes at MIB-QKI, um, but nowhere else in the genome. And we also see no other uh, mutations affecting protein coding sequences in the rest of the genome. Uh, so, single events. Um, in every case where we saw MIB-QKI rearrangement, 
um, we found that the QKI breakpoint was conserved between exons four and five. The mid breakpoint was not. And it could extend from exon nine. It could be an exon nine after exon nine or ex after exon 15 or in between. But the fusion protein was always in frame. Um, now, this is an interesting uh, rearrangement because the, both of the genes involved are interesting. Uh, QKI is a member of the star family of genes. It regulates uh, mRNA uh, processing and plays central roles in neural development. It's also been found to be a tumor suppressor gene in adult glioblastomas. So this is um, a summary of um, TCGA data on uh, uh, adult glioblastomas. Uh, showing the significance of uh, deletions on the x-axis across part of um, chromosome 6, where QKI resides. Um, and the, um, uh, th th we see a peak of deletions that hits just at QKI. And if you blow up these, uh, look at the copy number of profiles of these tumors and blow up around QKI, you see that many of these uh, 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 tumors undergo homozygous deletions, actually, that affect QKI and no other gene. So QKI itself seems to be a tumor suppressor gene in adult glioblastomas. It hasn't been shown so in uh, uh, pediatric glioblastomas. Um, MIB is also a well-known proto-oncogene in leukemias and other cancer types. It's, an, it's a tr uh, transcription factor. It controls proliferation, but it's not expressed in the brain. Uh, this is um, expression data from brain cortex, normal brain cortex, as well as other tissue types. And we see, um, we've, what we saw when we analyzed these uh, uh, you know, RNA-seq data sets is that the, the brain cortical sample that had the highest expression of, of MIB had less expression than the average expression, average expression across any of these other tissue types that we looked at. So it's not typically expressed in the brain, um, but it is a proto-oncogene. What we find is that when you um, have the MIB-QKI fusion, that leads to an induction of um, MIB-QKI expression relative, so and, and I should say MIB expression, relative to normal tissue or to um, uh, uh, low-grade gliomas that do not have the, the rearrangement. And that expression is only of the rearranged allele. It only, um, you only see expression of the exons up to the breakpoint in uh, the rearrangement, and then not the exons after that, which means that the wild-type version is not expressed. This is a direct consequence of the rearrangement. Um, that's likely because, uh, we, we, su we suspected that that was likely because the um, uh, enhancers associated with QKI were brought towards um, MIB. And in fact, I mean, QKI is expressed in the brain. Uh, it's involved in neural development. Um, when we look at uh, HDK27 acetyl maps of uh, uh, pediatric low-grade gliomas, um, we see no, uh, I should say, I'm sorry, here it's neural stem cells. Uh, we, see, we see no enhancers around MIB. Um, uh, but we see multiple enhancers around QKI. Um, and uh, we see that many of those enhancers actually bind MIB-QKI when we do CHIP-seq for, for, for MIB in MIB-QKI expressing cells. Um, so the uh, 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 thought here is that um, the rearrangement brings enhancers from uh, QKI towards MIB, enabling its expression, expression of this proto-oncogene. And in fact, when we did uh, reporter assays, I won't go into details, but you, if you express um, uh, one of the enhancers associated with QKI, uh, along with a MIB promoter, you enhance expression of uh, luciferase, uh, uh, the luciferase reporter relative to, to expression of, the, uh, at least with the MIB promoter alone. So, so bringing these enhancers enables increased expression. Um, and, and I should say this, particularly in the setting of expression of uh, MIB, MIB QKI, uh, uh, so that you have this auto feedback loop. Um, so uh, uh, we, we have a reason for why you'd have expression of MIB in the setting of the rearrangement. Um, uh, truncation of MIB in the past and leukemias has been shown to be oncogenic. We express the truncated allele. When we um, when you express the truncated uh, truncated MIB in neural stem cells, we see increased proliferation and tumor formation. Um, when you see, uh, and, and we see similar effects when you express MIB QKI, which includes the truncated allele as well, you know, truncated MIB as well as the bits of QKI that are attached to it, um, it get tumors as well. Um, but there's an additional effect to the QKI suppression, uh, to, to, the, to the MIB QKI rearrangement, in that it, um, uh, it takes out one of the two copies of wild type QKI. And so you get less expression of QKI across all exons than, um, than uh, in tumors with the rearrangement than in tumors without the rearrangement. 
so that um, uh, about 50% exp uh, less expression what you might expect, given that you take out one of two copies. And uh, you see a signature um, in angiocentric gliomas that is reflective of the signature that you see when you suppress QKI uh, to a small extent in, in sort of cells, in neural stem cells in vitro. So it looks like you see effects of that, uh, of uh, this reduction in uh, QKI expression. And when you uh, uh, suppress QKI in um, uh, neural stem cells, um, uh, it, particularly in the context of MIB-QKI expression, you get an induction of proliferation. So expressing, um, uh, uh, so if you suppress QKI in cells that don't express MIB or um, MIB-QKI, you don't get an induction of uh, so, um, uh, proliferation in neural stem cells. But if you express truncated MIB, you get some induction. And if you express MIB-QKI, you get much more induction. So this is suggesting that there's some sort of synergistic effect which we don't understand yet, between suppression of, of QKI and expression of MIB-QKI. So that argue, all this put together argues that this one uh, rearrangement has a very complex uh, effect on um, uh, if, uh, complex effects that, that le uh, combine lead to um, uh, uh, transformation. Uh, first off, um, uh, the, when the rearrangement occurs, uh, the enhancers associated with QKI are brought towards MIB, enabling expression of the fused protein. That fused protein includes truncated MIB, which is oncogenic. And then also this uh, whole process takes out one copy of um, QKI, which en enhances oncogenesis. Um, so uh, that's uh, all I wanted to talk about in terms of the uh, 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 genomic profiling studies that we've done recently of um, pediatric uh, brain tumors. I would like to acknowledge folks in my lab, including Mimi Bandapadaya, Guillaume Berktold, who uh, drove much of this, as well as Keith's lab, um, and then uh, many other people, uh, and I should say uh, funding, particularly from the PLGA Foundation. Thank you.